Welcome everybody to Just Roots Holiday themed cooking workshop. Today is a full day. Uh, we definitely have a full course meal um, in store for us today. We're going to be making stewed, well, smoky stewed kale, um, just like a really savory kale dish, stewed greens. We're going to be making a polenta dish. Polenta is um, just cornmeal. It's locally ground cornmeal. And it's a really creamy, amazing grain. And then we're also going to be doing a, a holiday ham. And we, we have a really interesting glaze that we're going to be putting on this one. It's miso made locally from South River miso. And it's a sweet, my, sweet white miso. And we're also going to be using um, local apple cider and local apples in that glaze. So we're really excited about that. I just wanted to go over really quickly all the things that I have out to help make this recipe go really smoothly today. Um, so starting with our ham, um, you're going to, we're, we're gonna prepare the glaze for the live class. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit about what, if you haven't cooked your ham yet, what you would wanna do for that. But for the glaze, we're gonna use the miso, some butter, um, one or two apples, the local apple cider, some type of sweetener, about a half cup of sweetener. So I'm going to use brown sugar. You can use white sugar. You can use maple syrup. You can use honey if you'd like to. The recipe called for brown sugar, but all of those will work great. Um, of course, your ham, which we'll get into in just a second. Then we're also going to use... Um, Sorry, I've got a home line ringing. Um, we have a apple or a vegetable peeler for peeling the apple because we're gonna make sure to peel that before. We have uh, a grater. We're gonna get the apple grated into really fine pieces. If you don't have a grater, you can use a knife. That's totally fine. Um, a meat thermometer. So this is gonna help you with, if you are cooking the ham now, we're gonna wanna take the temperature to make sure it's fully cooked. If you don't have a meat thermometer, the directions that we have uh, should be pl plenty ample for, and there's directions also on your ham to make sure it's fully cooked through. Um, I got a half cup measuring cup just because that's nice and easy. So that's everything we're gonna use um, for the ham. Plus, if you did get to the step we're at already, um, from the directions, I just cooked this ham for 45 minutes. It was a four pound ham um, and it was covered in tin foil. And now I'm gonna be moving it when I do the glaze into a sheet pan so that glaze doesn't get all over the bottom of your oven. For the stewed kale greens, I've got kind of a big heavy, heavy bottomed pot. That's going to be what we're gonna cook the greens, the onions, everything in um, in that pot. Um, and then we have, I brought out a big bowl so I could, once we de-stem the kale leaves, I can put it in there in the meantime. We've got local tomato puree, locally ground smoked paprika. If you haven't smelled it yet, I encourage you to do it. It smells wonderful. Um, you know, four or five cloves of garlic, uh, some onion. I'm doing two because they're pretty small. You provide your own vinegar, any kind of vinegar will work. And then I have a fourth cup measuring and some measuring spoons. A whisk is also helpful when we're making polenta and we'll switch eventually to a wooden spoon, but the whisk is nice up front. I have polenta measuring cups. And again, I'm gonna cook the polenta and what I would cook rice in. So I'm just using a pot that has a lid. Okay, so we've gone through everything that we're going to need for today. I want to touch briefly upon the ham. So you probably got a, a ham within a four to six pound range. Um, we suggest doing 10 to 15 minutes per pound uh, for your ham. Um, for every, So 10 to 15 minutes for each pound of that ham. And um, if you don't have a meat thermometer, I'd rest more on the 15 minute per pound just to be safe. At the very end, your ham should be 145 degrees Fahrenheit. 
that that's the safe temperature. I just want to point out too that when you pull that ham out of the oven, it's while it rests, it's still going to come up a few degrees in temperature, up to five degrees. So just consider that too if you're using a meat thermometer. So really quick, what I did with this ham is I simply, I left it in the packaging it came in and I filled a, a bowl with hot water and I rested the ham in there for about an hour. Then I took the ham out of its packaging and I wrapped it really well in tin foil. It's still a little bit hot. Um, so I wrapped it so that the juices would stay within it. So a heavy duty tin foil is great. Um, but we are going to be pulling this off to put the glaze on it. So I, I did 45 minutes, um, taking into account that 10 to 15 minutes per pound for my four-ish pound ham. I did that at 350 degrees. Those are in your recipe, all the notes for that. Now what we're going to do is start on our glaze. And we're going to make our glaze first because I can push it off to the side and let it sit and cool. Um, and then at the very end of class, when we have about 10 minutes left, we're going to apply that glaze and stick it in the oven at 450, but we can hold off till then. Okay, so let's get moving on our glaze and feel free to write any questions that you might have in the chat. Emily's going to repeat all of the amounts of everything I'm doing. Uh, so you'll have those answers there, but please don't hesitate to ask. So I'm starting off by peeling my apples. It wouldn't be the end of the world to not peel the apple. Um, you might just have like harder skin pieces in that glaze. So we're gonna go ahead and peel it for this workshop. If you want it on the sweeter tartar side, your glaze, then I would go ahead and do two apples, but one apple should certainly suffice. And so once I have it almost pretty much all peeled there. I'm going to go ahead and use a box grater. And I'm going to get that apple nice and grated. And this is going to be a little messy. It's a juicy apple. But it's kind of refreshing how fast apples grate compared to carrots and potatoes like we've done in other workshops. Kind of a breeze. And when I'm done grating that, I'm going to take the little pieces of apple I've just grated, and I'm gonna stick them directly into a stove pot with a heavy bottom so we can start our glaze, right? So I'm making sure to leave the core intact. I don't really want any of that hard stuff in my glaze. And then we're gonna get this wonderful apple pulp into our pot. My pot does not have heat on it yet. I'm gonna get all the ingredients in there at once and then work on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and peel one more apple. And if you wanna save one for eating because they're beautiful, delicious apples, you don't have to do both. And also, you know, if you had one very large apple, maybe just do that. You can use your intuition. And for those of you who are a step ahead of us, you can start measuring out some of the other ingredients listed on the recipe. And we're gonna just put it all in that pot together. This is why I love these big knives. They're just the ultimate scoopers. Brooke, what kind of apples did we give everyone in this kit? If, if folks wanted to make it again, what kind of apple should they get? You can, I mean, you can use Granny Smith. You can use any apple. Um, I, I don't even know what these are. Maybe either, Port, I think they're Portland. Um, a Macintosh apple would work great. A Kala apple would work great. Um, we just, the emphasis for us in this recipe was what can we get locally? Okay, so I've got my wonderful apple sort of slaw in here. Okay, and now we're gonna measure out the rest of the ingredients and I'm gonna wipe up my apple juice a little bit. Okay. So 
we're going to do half a cup of brown sugar or whatever sweetener you're going to use. I just want to point out that if you are using a liquid sweetener, it's going to take a little bit more time to boil down into a glaze. So just keep that in mind. If you're using a, a liquidy sweetener like honey, agave, maple syrup, it may take a little bit longer to get your glaze to that thick consistency that we want, but that's totally fine. Half a cup of brown sugar. And if you are avoiding sweeteners altogether, it's not gonna destroy this recipe. It's the apple is gonna have some nice sweetness too. So don't, don't worry if you wanna skip out on that. Um, we're going to use a half cup of apple cider. I like to give it a good shake. Some stuff settles on the bottom quite a bit with this raw cider. One half cup. And then we're gonna use two tablespoons of butter. I'm using a vegan butter because I can't eat butter. So I'll go ahead and measure it out or else you can just cut down the line, the stick of butter for two tablespoons. And two. Okay. Away. And then we're going to do a two teaspoons of black pepper. So you can do that by eye if you just have a grinder and salt to taste. So I'm going to do about a half teaspoon of salt because our ham is smoky. It's going to have plenty of salt going on. So I'm doing a half teaspoon. And then I'm going to do the black pepper just by eye. And then we're going to turn the heat um, onto like medium for a start. And then we're going to keep a close eye on it and keep stirring it for a while. Okay. And I actually don't need the lid for the glaze until we want to close it up um, because we won't be applying it till the end of class. Make sure you have something to stir and get all those ingredients incorporated. I have a feeling that I'm just going to want to eat this with a spoon. Butter and apple, yeah. And I'm just using my wooden spoon to break up that clot of butter a little bit. I have medium heat again. If you are messy like me, feel free to take a minute to just get your station cleaned up as we move on to the next thing. So that's that's it. That's the whole glaze. You're going to watch it cook, but all the ingredients are in there. And you don't need your grater anymore. Okay. The next thing I wanted to do is just go ahead. Everything kind of takes different amounts of time here. Um, Polenta takes a little bit longer than the greens, so let's go ahead and get started with that. So again, I'm kind of using a nice like rice pot that has a secure fitting lid. And we're gonna start off with four cups of water to one cup of cornmeal. The water is gonna go in first with some salt. We're gonna get it to a boil and then we'll pour in our polenta. So four cups of water and one teaspoon of salt. And you can turn that on high because we're just going to get it boiling. So I'm going to measure out. If you've never had plenty before, you're definitely in for a treat. A lot of people make polenta with, I'll wait till my heater or my Stove is off. My little propane heater. A lot of people actually make polenta with heavy cream or milk, and you can certainly do that if you want a richer polenta, but I think it's absolutely wonderful just with water and butter, of course. We're using butter for this recipe. Okay, so I'm getting that heated up with one teaspoon of salt.
four cups of water with a little spoon of salt. And I'm going to pour out my polenta. So polenta is just a, it's like um very similar to grits. It's the Italian um cornmeal and it's a thick ground cornmeal. You can see it um, as you pour it out and it, it becomes super creamy and smooth in texture over time. Okay. So now I'm just gonna let ourselves catch up a bit before we move on to something new. I wanna get the polenta into that hot water before. We have too many tasks to juggle at once. Now is a great time for questions if you have any or just get yourself caught up for a moment. Oh, and I I didn't measure out the glaze for the miso, my goodness. Um, we're doing one half cup of miso. You probably added that into yours. It was probably just me who forgot because I picked it up, but didn't measure it. And I'm just using a dry measuring cup for that half cup of miso. If you've never had miso before, it is ferment it's fermented um soybeans. So it has a really salty, delicious taste. It's most commonly served in miso soup. It's more and more lately been used in a lot of desserts as this like sweet, savory balance. And now it makes my absolute favorite salad dressing ever. So really get into miso. It's so healthy for you. Um and uh I think it'll be pair super well with this ham. And I'm gonna stir that in a little bit too. Yeah, and as Brooke mentioned, this miso in particular is really special because it's made right here in the Pioneer Valley. Um, it's made in Conway, which is actually right down the road from where I live. It's Rare to find local miso. So we're lucky to to have some. Yeah, we certainly are. Okay, I'm gonna put this away, put this away while I wait for that to heat up. And so as your glaze starts to heat up, we're gonna wanna stir it pretty regularly. Um, uh, at, and what we're looking for is sort of a thick and bubbly consistency, and that's, going to happen with the natural sugars that are in the apple and or your brown sugar or whatever you added. Smells so good already. Okay. The last thing we're going to work on is our greens. And I think what we're going to start with is vegetable prep. So we're going to get the kale onions and garlic ready so you can get those out if you haven't already. The first thing that's going to go in the pot is the onions. So let's start off with those. We're going to dice our onions up. They don't have to be super small. Um, they're going to have plenty of time to get cooked down. Make sure we're continuously stirring if you're able. Seems like my rice is about to boil too. So I'm going, oh, let me move this one. Dicing my onion here. Not sure if I've mentioned this before, but we've done a botanical dye workshop where we use kitchen scraps and plants to dye clothing and onion skins are actually a wonderful plant dye. They dye any, well, I mean, depending on what you fix them with, um, they dye anywhere between light yellow, orange, pink. Um, it's really, really a beautiful dye. If you ever consider that, save your onions and your avocado pits and all of that. And again, I'm doing kind of two small onions here, just dicing them up. Okay. 
My water is boiling for my polenta. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop that polenta in. The water is already salted. And what's really important with polenta is you're gonna to wanna to stir it so it doesn't stick to the bottom initially. You wanna separate those grains from each other. So it's really important in the first five minutes to continuously stir. After that, we're kind of gonna leave it alone like we would rice and close it up. But right now I'm gonna put it on a medium heat and I'm gonna check it you know, every couple minutes and give it a stir and it's open. Your glaze is gonna be on medium, medium, low. We're also gonna be giving that a few stirs. And as I mentioned with the polenta, I really like to stir with, um, why am I forgetting the name of this device? <laughs> Emily? A whisk. Uh, a whisk. Yeah, <laughs> you give it a good whisk, just like the verb. Um, yeah. Polenta is on uh, medium, medium low for the glaze. We're getting some bubbly action. We're trying to get rid of some of that water from the apple and the apple cider. And so I know there's a lot going on at once and you're doing fabulous. Um, and if you have time, just continue chopping. If you don't, it can wait. It can certainly wait. If you are ahead of me for some reason, you can start cooking your onion um, in a fourth cup of olive oil in your heavy bottom pan. And don't forget that pan wants to be pretty big to leave room for the kale. Or you can start chopping your other stuff, your kale and your, um, your garlic, which will be minced or sliced super thin, whichever, whichever is cluttered. Okay, so just to make room on my cutting board, I'm gonna put in one fourth cup of olive oil. I'm using extra virgin, but cooking oil is great too. I'm even gonna measure mine. And you want a good amount of olive oil. When you think about how much kale is going in there, um, one fourth cup might seem like a lot, but I think it's pretty perfect. And then I'm going to just move these onions over there so I don't have to share a plate. Now, because the onions take a little bit longer than garlic to cook, you can turn that stove on if you want. But if it feels like it's too much right now with watching three other or two other things, feel free to hold off. Maybe I'll just turn mine on low and start to get those cooking. Okay, and so now would be a great time to check that polenta again. Give it a stir with a whisk. And pretty soon we'll be able to forget about it, close it up and set a timer. We're almost there. I'm gonna show you guys what my glaze is starting to look like. It's not, let's see, there you go. Not quite ready yet, smelling really good. Um, it still has quite a bit of liquid, so I'm gonna keep it going a little longer. And in the meantime, feel free to start chopping your garlic. So the recipe calls for four cloves. If you're a garlic person, feel free to do more. You can do four to six. If you're not so crazy about garlic, just two is fine. And you can either slice them really thin or dice them. I have pretty small ones, so I'm gonna do five cloves. So if you saw what I just did, I used a knife to break um, the skin of the garlic so it's easier to, to peel off. I just used my own weight and pressure on the flat part of the knife, not, not the edge. And, um, and that really helps break off the skin. Like that. 
Um, I, I leave the root end behind as I'm slicing thinly. Put that off to the side. Nice little slices. And go ahead and mince them if you like, or just leave them in slices. It does not matter. It really doesn't. So much about cooking when you're doing multiple dishes, the overwhelming part is just there's a lot going on and you have to work on timing yourself. And I think the key is staying calm. And if you're feeling overwhelmed, turn something off and come back to it. It's not the end of the world to do that. So you should see your polenta at this point sort of kind of evenly taking up the pan. There's not like a ton of water along the sides. The polenta seems like it's it's just kind of settled almost into a pudding. Um, and at that point, what I'm going to suggest we do is turn our burners to quite low, very low. And then we're going to cover. So I put mine on like the lowest setting it goes. I'm going to cover it and I'm going to set a timer for 30 minutes. So it's on the lowest setting and we're just gonna let that slow cook. So the timer's set for 30 minutes. We're gonna maybe check and whisk it um, in, in a couple minutes just to see how it's doing, but really it's mostly just gonna be leaving it alone. At this point, if you, well, if you have made polenta before and you know you like it really creamy, you're more than welcome to add, you know, half and half or cream or a dash of oat milk or non-sweetened oat milk or something like that, you're welcome to do that. Um, I'm just gonna stick right to the recipe today. Okay, my glaze is definitely getting there. So I'm seeing a lot less water. It's wanting to stick a little bit to the bottom of the pan, which is why the stirring is important, but it's not quite sticking yet. It's not quite ready yet. I'm going to keep going with it, but it's starting to look close. Okay, so now we're still worried. We've got our three things still going. I'm going to turn my onions up and I'm going to start cooking these guys. And I want them to be nearly translucent or translucent before I add in my garlic. I like to cook them separately because I think garlic burns a lot faster. And uh, I don't want that. I don't want burnt garlic in my, I think our pe smoked paprika is enough spice for us. Enough smoke. All right, take a minute to get your station clean and we're gonna start pulling the kale from its stem. That's where a big bowl might come in handy. So you have somewhere to put it because it sure shrinks down, but it takes up a lot of space before it does. I got my big bowl. Checking my glaze. Okay, I'm there with my glaze. I don't need to do anything else. I'm gonna take it off the heat, get it covered up and put it to the side. Um, for when I'm ready to glaze my ham at the end of class. And now I only have two things to work with. My onions on the pot and my polenta, which is on super low heat. Okay, so back to kale. Beautiful kale leaves. Stems are edible, but they are definitely hard to digest. Um, you can save them and cut them up into small pieces and cook them later. These become rabbit treats on our farm. And what I'm doing is I'm just using my hands to pull the kale off of the stem. So I want the leaves. Now at the very top, there's gonna be some stem that's still attached. Don't worry about that. That's gonna cook down. It'll be okay. 
You can even break it into little pieces or at the end, I'll show you how to do a cigar method with your greens and get them nice and chopped up. I like to see how fast I can go with this process. That's kind of fun. Very satisfying task. So you may find that your kale leaves are a lot smaller than when you usually get them. And that's because kale, um, towards the end of its life, which we are here in winter, um, really only puts out a few leaves towards the top of the plant and local farmers will come around and cut the top of the plant, which is why you might have some more stem than you'd imagine. Um, so these are just the small um, tops of the kale leaves, the end of season kale, which is a little heartbreaking. It's during the season, there's too much of it, and it's the last green to go and it's sad to say goodbye, but we're we're pretty much there. Um, so I'm right now the amount of kale I have, I can squeeze into a ball with my two fists. I'm not sure what the size this is kale that I had. I'm not sure what the size was in the kits, but I wanted to bring up that if you don't, if you have less than this in your kit you may want to use less tomato puree. Um, so I'm gonna show you that again. I'm squeezing it all together in two hands. If you have significantly less than that, I would use less tomato puree. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, if you have more, then you'll probably wanna go ahead and use the whole jar, but we'll, we're gonna use our intuition and take a peek at what it looks like once it's when all of the ingredients are in the pot except for the kale. Okay. And I'm now hearing my onions starting to cook down a little bit faster. I'm not going to use all this kale. I pulled some of the last of it from my garden and I don't eat it. And you'll right now would be a great time to use um, your whisk, do a little bit of a stir on your polenta. It's natural that some of it will stick to the bottom. It's just a little bit difficult to get polenta not to stick to the bottom, like sometimes rice does. Um, and then we'll give our onions a stir. And I'm starting to see the translucent look that I want to see when you're getting close. We'll probably put the garlic in in a minute or two, and we're really only going to cook that garlic for two minutes. Now I'm going to show you what I was talking about. So the, the kale could stay in large pieces, but that would be a little difficult to chew. So what I'm going to do is I kind of use my hand to guide it all into a bunch or roll it, and then I'm going to make some vertical slices like that. and then some horizontal slices. It's just the best method I've found when you're cooking with a lot, a lot of greens. And you just wanted to get them a little bit smaller, bite-sized pieces. You can also alternatively get a piece, get your hands in there, just tear it up. Sometimes it feels good to give kale a little bit of a massage. And fabulous, it's looking good to me. I'll hold it up so you can see. Nice size pieces. This is a little big, I would break that up. Okay. At this point, I'm going to um, give my onions one more stir and then add in my garlic. And you'll notice you're probably going to have less burning than you would because we're using a really good amount of olive oil, quite a bit, that half, um, fourth cup. And in goes the garlic, and I'm going to immediately stir it.
I appreciate everyone bearing with me. I know there's um, a lot going on in this recipe and take it piece by piece. Um, take your time. There's no rush here. One thing I'm gonna suggest now is that we um, preheat our oven to 450 um, because in the last 10 minutes of class, we are going to put the glaze on our ham, stick it in the oven at 450 on a sheet pan, and we're gonna let that glaze turn into a nice like crunchy top of our um, hams. And it's gonna stay there for about 10 minutes. You're gonna pull it out and um, we're gonna take the temperature if you're able to, it should be at 145 when it's all finished resting. That's the temp that we wanna hit. All right, so my garlic's been in there for a good little minute. And so have my onions. So in seeing that, I guess I'm gonna try to be more precise for folks because I know all of our kale bunches are different. I'd say that I have about six cups of kale. I'm gonna use for six cups of kale, I'm gonna use the whole thing of tomato puree. I really want a lot of tomato puree. If I have like four cups, I might use half of a jar or something like that. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like in my jar once, or in my pot once we get there. That's hard to open. <laughs> There we go, the good sound. Okay, so I'm gonna put in this whole jar of puree. And at this point, you can even turn the heat to medium because puree has a ton of water in it. Tomatoes are made up of mostly water. Our goal right now is to boil a lot of that water off. So the next five to seven minutes in that pot, I wanna see water evaporating um, before we're gonna add the kale in. Now we don't want no water in there because we the kale wants to be, um, it wants to be steamed basically in that, in the um, liquid. So we do wanna get rid of some of the water, but we wanna keep the flavory water. I'm also gonna add in some of our smoked paprika at this point. So one of the best smells in the world, smoked paprika, I'm guessing is just peppers that have been ground down after being smoked. Um, it's powerful, it's delicious, um, and it goes super well with kale. I also wanna point out that I've made this recipe before with tomato paste, and if you don't have puree, tomato paste works wonderful as well. In that case, you actually have to add more water. Because this puree is pretty watery already, it's a locally made puree, I don't think we're gonna have to add any water in this recipe, but we can use our taste buds and see what we like. For people who struggle with high acidic foods, maybe using less tomato and more water would be a better idea. I'm gonna drop in a whole heaping, well for me, because I love paprika so much, a heaping teaspoon of paprika and smoked paprika. If you haven't heard of Kitchen Garden Farms, check them out. They sell amazing spices. Um, my favorite is our their Calabrian chili flakes. I, I thought all chili flakes were made the same. I was very wrong. They are amazing. Okay, so it's looking pretty nice and chunky now that I'm getting it blended in with those onions. I'm gonna, it's not too hot. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. It's kind of hard to see. And I'm gonna put it nice and probably on high or medium high, depending on your stove for like five minutes and get some of that excess water out. At that point, when we're done with that, we're gonna put in some vinegar and then salt and pepper to taste. And then we'll add the kale, cover it up and cook it for about 20 minutes. It may need a little longer depending on how chewy you like it. 20 to 30 minutes is what the recipe says. So that's boiling off. I'm gonna take a minute, check on our beautiful, oh, that was a lot of noise. 
the polenta is really starting to thicken up. So that's probably the last time I'm gonna use my whisk. Um, it's looking beautiful. It still has about 16 minutes on my timer. And you'll know it's done when you taste it. You shouldn't have any gritty textures. It should just be like a really soft, wonderful, like porridge texture. If you cook it longer, you can dry them out. And um, it, that's sometimes preferable. So one of my favorite things is having leftover polenta, which does dry out. You can take that leftover polenta and make like fried polenta balls or squares. Um, there's a million recipes I recommend Googling what to do with leftover polenta. You can always just reheat it, add some milk, add some water, and it'll be delicious. I'm going to give a little stir action as I see a lot of this water is really starting to move. Okay, folks, if I'm going way too fast, feel free to chime in and tell us to slow down a little bit. Okay, nobody's telling me to slow down. So I got out one of these brushes that I recently invested in. I felt very adult when I got one of these, very excited about it. Um, it's just a simple uh, brush that you can put glazes on with. But as many years I put glazes on without it, so you do not need one of these, but they do cost like 50 cents. If you're able to get them, I suggest it. It's really nice when you're putting like brushing olive oil on garlic bread or things like that. Um, and what I'm going to do is I've got my little workstation here where I have my ham that was in the oven. Um, and it has aluminum foil on it. And I'm going to unwrap the top of the ham. So I've got this beautiful smoked ham in here. And the smoky flavors go so well with miso. All right. And it, the ham is still sitting in quite a bit of its juice. So I opened it up, up enough that I'm going to really slabber on this glaze. It's going to drip off the sides. It may drip out of the... Um, Tin foil, that's okay. We're gonna we're gonna have some glaze issues. We always do. Glaze makes a mess, but it's worth it. It's delicious. Now, I have all this beautiful. Well, it's not actually it doesn't look that beautiful, but it's beautiful tasting. Um, glaze of our apple and apple cider and miso, and I'm really slobbing it on there. What's important to note is that this glaze will be so much better once it sits and tenderizes with the meat. And this is the sauce you're gonna serve with the ham. So you want, you do wanna get a lot of that on there. You can really pour it, push it onto the sides. And if you haven't yet, this is a good time um, to set your oven to 450 because we're going to cook it for 10 minutes like this. And we are going to leave it open this time. It's going to be open. It's not going to be closed. Voila. I like to push up the sides a little bit if I can. That looks and, beautiful. Yeah. And if you want, you can put more tin foil. If you want to put more tin foil on the bottom of your pan, um, you can certainly do that and just avoid more glaze staining. I'm just going to deal with it like this. And I like to reserve whatever extra foil I have because as we pull it out of the oven, we're going to let it sit. And I like to cover it a little bit to keep that heat in. We're going to let it sit, finish coming to temp, rest, which we know is important with a lot of cooking meats, and then um, get it covered while that's happening. Okay, so my greens have been bubble or my green stew has been bubbling away. So now I'm gonna add some vinegar, salt and pepper, and then we're gonna fold our kale into the mixture. So I'd say I'm gonna use, I am a big fan of pepper. So I'm probably using an eighth of a teaspoon. 
Just directly into the pot, pot is fine. I'm going to use about mm, a half teaspoon of salt. But again, you can do this to your taste and your preference. And then vinegar calls for one tablespoon. If you don't like vinegar, you don't have to do that much. Um, you may even want more vinegar as you're serving it. So right now we're just doing one. Taste it, see how you like it. There's already a lot of acidity because of the tomatoes. So keep that in mind. There's my teaspoon of vinegar, tablespoon, my, my fault, not a teaspoon. Tablespoon of vinegar. Where'd I put all my utensils? There they are. Give that a good stir. And I'm starting, I've definitely lost a lot of the water. So I'm turning the heat down to medium low. And I'm gonna start folding in that kale. So I just use my hands to drop it in a little bit, little at a time. So the kale wilts and makes room. So this would be called raising kale. We're just using a little bit of liquid in here. Now, if yours becomes a little bit too dry, you can use more of your tomato puree or you can use water, chicken stock, beef stock, and just do little bits at a time. Really kind of depends on how much kale everyone has. <laughs> So I'm gonna get mine all stirred in before I cover it. And I'm gonna assess, maybe I do want water, maybe I don't. And make sure it's really nice and mixed well throughout. It's kind of amazing when you put a whole jar of that tomato puree, you think you're you're it's gonna be way too watery, but it it just you everything gets soft up. And I'm not gonna lie, stewed greens, um, you know, they're easier to digest when kale is cooked this way than when you're eating it raw. And it really helps me with my digestion to help move everything. So um it's, it's definitely something I recommend. If you can get into different recipes for your stewing greens, it's just so good for your digestion and it's so tasty. And really easy too. Once, once you start to get the feel for your balance of acid, um, what you like to, what flavors you like to pair it with, et cetera. All right, I'm gonna give you a little peek. So I don't have excess liquid, but it's not dry. It's not gonna burn. At this point, I'm gonna close it up, put it on low heat, medium low. And I'm gonna let that cook for 20 minutes. So if I was already, wasn't using my phone, I would set a timer responsibly, but um, I can't do that right now. So in 20 minutes, I know that kale should be pretty good to go, um, which would make that, it's like 612 for me if you're on my timeline is when my kale will be done um and i have seven minutes left on my polenta i'm going to switch to my my spoon and give it a stir looking fabulous And depending on how low you had your heat, every stove setting is different. Just keep in mind that you want, it should be fully tender by the time you pull it off. Um, yeah, and pretty soon we're gonna mix in some butter into our polenta. And when you, we'll use two tablespoons of butter and then we'll use an additional tablespoon if you'd like when you're serving. So once this happens, once our timer goes off for that, the seven minute timer, it tastes decent and done. I'll add the butter and then I'll let it sit for five minutes with two tablespoons of butter. And then I will um, serve it up and you can always serve it with more butter. If your polenta is looking dry, a little too dry, too sticking to the pan, add more water or add some kind of oat milk, almond milk, 
half and half, heavy cream, something like that. Just want to keep it creamy. Okay. So I told everyone else to preheat their oven. Now I'm going to get mine. It was already preheated to 350, so it won't take very long. Okay. Fabulous. And then we're going to keep checking on our kale and we're going to keep stirring that. I know we only have six minutes, but I think we're doing really good on time. I think one thing I'd like to hit before we um, take leave and enjoy our meals is just where am I going to take the temperature of this ham? Um, and basically, like a safe rule of thumb is you want to go to the innermost, thickest part uh, of the meat when you're taking the temperature. So pretty deep in there. Right now, I'm not going to get an accurate reading because my I, I pulled this out of the stove a little early so I could demonstrate. Um, but it's at 100 right now. I stuck it in pretty deep. Um, these hams are bone in, so just keep that in mind if you hit something hard. And um, you want it to say 145 on that thermometer. I do feel very safe in our estimates of 15 minutes per pound on that ham is going to be just fine. These are smoked um, hams as well. So, And in a minute when my timer or when my oven's heated up, I'm going to plop this ham in there for 10 minutes on 450. If your oven's not super powerful, the recipe that we pulled this inspiration from even suggested broiling. And if you're going to broil, so putting it on as hot as it goes, 500 for most stoves, and, and you're going to put it pretty close to that broiler, let's keep an eye, a close eye on it with an oven light to make sure you're not getting burning happening. When your polenta is done, just leave it covered, let it sit. Um, when it's like totally done, you've added your butter. If you're having all of this meal together, it's going to stay nice and warm if it's covered. Okay, I'm going to get my butter ready. I'm just doing two, two to start, two tablespoons of butter. That's going to get mixed in with the polenta. You can do heaping tablespoons. I'm not going to tell anyone. That's certainly what I did. Okay. Great. No questions? Emily, thank you so much for reporting all, all of the details in there. Sure. Yeah, I hope it's been helpful for folks. I can at all, giving that a little stir. Again, folks, if it's looking dry, which it shouldn't, it should just at from the point that you got all that kale mixed in, it's just your the kale's just gonna steam and lose more water. So you shouldn't have to add any after that. But test it for salt and pepper, see if you want more. Um, it's a little too hot to do that with my finger. What was I thinking there? Um Test it for flavor. See if you want more vinegar in the stewed greens. And also, when you're when you're tasting these things, don't just think about how it tastes on its own. Think about well, this is going to go. I'm going to put the the greens over my polenta, so it's going to be a really tangy, intense flavored green. But the polenta itself isn't a very powerful flavor. So those two things mixed together, I might want to overcompensate, have more vinegar, a little more salt. Mm. a little more zing on my kale because it's going to be going over a blander polenta. A bland but buttery polenta. All right. I have just a matter of seconds left on my timer for that polenta, so I'm going to drop in my butter and very just slowly stir that butter in. Oh, 
looking great. Some people like to pepper their polenta too. You're welcome to do that. I think there's enough pepper going on in the rest of the dish. And that butter is going to add some liquid to the polenta. So that's why we want to let it sit for about five minutes covered up. The grains will absorb even more. And I'm going to turn the heat off and let that sit. My oven just also told me that it's ready. It's at 450. Stick the ham in. And I'm going to set a new timer for 10 minutes. Okay, I know we're at time and I can't believe we did it. But I just want to say one more thing. So don't forget, when you pull your ham out, if it's reading 140, 141, that's okay. You can pull it out. And why is because as the ham rests, it's going to climb up in degrees. So it's going to keep... Um, it's going to keep raising, rising in temperature. Um, if it's a little bit over that, it's still going to be delicious. So don't worry about that. Um, keep an eye out for burning. Uh, if you are using broil, if you're at 450, you should be okay with the glaze and you might get some smoking just because the glaze is running off onto the pan and that sugar, the sugars in the glaze will burn kind of quickly, but we do want that to happen a bit. So we get our nice crust. I'm going to, we've just got, you know, 10, 10, 12 minutes on our uh, kale. Our polenta is going to sit and absorb that butter, stay nice and warm and covered up. Your ham's going to be out in 10 minutes and you should be ready to eat. All right. Well, if you have any questions, you can certainly ask them now. If not, um, I just want to share that next cooking class is actually in this, it's December 12th, right, Emily? Tuesday, December 12th. Mm -hmm. And we picked the recipe for that one already. It's a, um, it's a delicious kimchi stew that we're making. If you haven't had kimchi before, don't knock it until you try it. It's delicious. Um, this stew is going to it's, it's one of my favorite foods on the planet and it makes me very happy to be eating it. And it's such a warming dish to have in the winter. So we'd love to have you at that class. Uh, the signups either have already gone out or are going to be going out very soon just because of this holiday turnaround. Um, and yeah, we hope that you have a wonderful time with friends, family, and loved ones over the next week and get to share this lovely food with your community. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy. Emily, you want to end the recording? Sure.